So let's start off with some important definitions in review. Remember, you've learned all of this already in the first term. So let's now just revise these important points. And you know, grade 12s, on the screen, we have two definitions that almost always come up for examination. Firstly, a homologous series is defined as a series of organic compounds that can be described by the same general formula. So when we talk of homologous series, we're talking of families of compounds such as alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, aldehydes, ketones, carboxylic acids, alcohols, and esters. Those are what we call homologous series. You remember that? Secondly, define the term functional group. Well, a functional group is defined as, as you can see on the screen, a bond or an atom or a group of atoms that determines the physical and chemical properties of a group of organic compounds. Please, grade 12s, learn these two definitions off by heart. They are in the running for the final examination. Somewhere along the line, they are going to be examined. Whether in question one, the multiple choice, or later on in the first two or three questions in connection with organic chemistry. So what are we really saying? Well, let's have a look at this very nice chart that's given to us from the examination guidelines. Here we see the homologous series on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, we have the structure of the functional group and the description. Now we know the alkanes, are all carbon, they all they have carbons and hydrogens. They're, they're very easy to recognize, the alkanes. Notice the description, there's only carbon to hydrogen and carbon to carbon single bonds. What about the alkenes? Well, there's a double bond between two carbon atoms, as you can see. The alkynes, there's a triple bond between the carbon to carbon atoms. And then we have the halo alkanes. Halo, that prefix, comes from the halogen. Remember on the periodic table, all the elements in group number 17, as you can see there in the middle, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Those are the halogens that we are concerned with. And they bond to an alkane. Hence, that compound is called a halo alkane. Typical example is bromoethane or chloropropane. So there we go. Now we move on. Then we come to the aldehydes. And the aldehydes are recognized by a functional group that consists or is found at the end of the molecule. Keep that in mind. It's always at the end. And there you have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen and a single bond hydrogen. Remember, they always that functional group is always at the end. And that functional group is known as the formyl group. The aldehydes all end with L, the first two letters of the word aldehyde. So you have, for example, ethanol, propanol, butanol, hexanol, L, etc. All right, so that's how we recognize that that is an aldehyde. Remember, they have the formyl group. Then we have the ketones. Ketones are recognized by means of the carbonyl group, right? Carbonyl group. And that is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen between two carbons. So it's inside the molecule. And of course, as you know, very importantly, grade 12s, you must ring your functional group when you write out your structural formula. Ketones are compounds such as propanone, butanone, hexanone. All right, they end with O-N-E, as you know. Then we have our carboxylic acids, and they are distinguished by means of the carboxyl group. Don't mix up carboxyl and carbonyl. Remember, the carbonyl group 
is found in the ketones, whereas the carboxyl group is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen with an OH attachment, a hydroxyl group attachment. Hence, it's called a carboxyl group. And so there we're looking at compounds such as ethanoic acid, propanoic acid, butanoic acid, hexanoic acid. Very easy to find um, carboxylic acids because the word acid is already there, so that's a big clue. And as we know, when we take an alkane plus a carboxylic acid, we're going to talk about that in our program this morning, we form an ester. And that was the theme of terms one formal investigation, practical investigation, the preparation of esters. Remember, esters have this functional group here. There's no name for that, but that's how it looks. It's a carbon double, bond, double bonded to an oxygen with another oxygen, and then you have a carbon attached to that oxygen as well. And so esters always end with the letters O A T E. For example, ethyl propanoate, butyl hexanoate. That's how we know it's an ester. Very important. Now, let's move on. Something that really gives learners a lot of problems in the exam is this concept of isomers. And isomer, these are basically, in, in a sense, we can say these are the twins that occur in organic chemistry. You see, we're going to deal with three of them, the chain isomers, the positional isomers, and the functional isomer. And I can hear you saying, oh, you know, I, I always get confused with all of these. Well, grade 12s, don't despair. We know you'll do so well. You see, the chain isomers, as we can see on the screen, have the same molecular formula, but different types of chains. For example, look at butane, which is shown for us there on the left. And all that's happened is we've rearranged one of the carbons with three hydrogens along the chain. We've put it by carbon number two. Hence, that compound becomes two methyl. So, here we are with two methyl propane. So once again, we just rearrange the carbon along the chain there. Okay, fine. All right, Zandi, can you see it's in um, presentation mode? Yes, sir. Okay, great, yes, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Apologies, I don't know what happened to that slide. You know, anyway, probably one of the gremlins on my computer, you know? <laughs> I try to figure this thing out, but anyway, all's well that ends well. Thank you, Zandi. Appreciate that. Okay, right. Great 12s. Here we are. Remember, that was the chain isomer. So all we do is we rearrange that. Now we come to positional isomers. These are the same, these have the same molecular formula, but different positions on the side of on the side chain. All the substitute substituents or functional groups on the parent chain. So what are we talking about here? Well, let's look at the example. Look at the structural formula for one chloropropane. I think you can see that there's a chlorine in there and it's attached to the first carbon, right? So that's why we call that one one dash chloropropane. But look at the, the one to the right of that. Look what happened to that chlorine. He swapped positions. It's now by the second carbon, hence we call that 2-chloropropane. You got that great class? As easy as that. So once again, positional isomers is where there's the same molecular formula, but just a different position on the chain. That's really what it's all about. You have another example at the bottom, but-1-ene, right? Remember, the double bond is, be, is the, the first bond there. That's why it's but dash one between the first two carbons. Now, look at that double bond has moved positions. Hence, it becomes but dash two dash in. Another one could be but dash three that's in. And so the story goes. Okay, so that's positional isomers. Now, functional isomers. These are compounds with the same 
molecular formula, but different functional groups. For example, look at the ester on the left-hand side. That is called methyl, right? You can see that there's an H, a C, and an O, right? Methanoate. Okay, so there you have your methyl. There we have the C with three H's around there. That's what on the right-hand side. There we have the methyl, and then the F, methanoate is to the left of that. Here we have ethanoic acid, also called acetic acid, as we know. All right, so there we have that whole situation. So methyl, methanoate can become ethanoic acid. Now, a very good rule of thumb to remember, grade 12, functional isomers, esters, can become carboxylic acids. Just keep that in mind. So if you are asked to give the functional isomer of a carboxylic acid, remember, you need to look in the direction of esters. If you ask to find the um, functional isomer of a ketone, then they will become an aldehyde and vice versa. So the ketones and aldehydes become functional isomers interchangeably, as well as the esters and carboxylic acids become functional isomers interchangeably and so on. We just rearrange the atoms according on the chain and so the story. All right, fine, there we go. Now we come to nomenclature, right? Now this is where we get into our program for after revising those important points, now we get into our exercise. Now grade 12s, just to mention, I know that your teacher at the various centers has printed off this information for you. We're gonna work through this, so now we'll count on you for your input. Notice what it says, let's first survey this question. Question says, the letters A to F in the table below represent six organic compounds. Look at compound A. There we see carbon, three hydrogens, carbon, two hydrogens, carbon, two hydrogens, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Oh dear. Then compound B, ah, the thing that stands out in compound B to me is the double bond. Do you remember that? So let's just get a, um, an answer from the audience. What homologous series do you think we involved with there in compound B? Anybody like to give a comment in that connection? Is it an alkane? I'll give you a multiple choice. Is it an alkane? Is it an alkene? Or is it an alkyne? What would you say? Choose one of the three. Sandile, do we have a comment? Uh, not yet, Mr. Goldstone. Okay, don't worry. Still early. I'll give them some more time. Is it an alkane? Is it an alkene? Or is it an alkyne? Um, there's a comment that is coming up. All right. Um, from Zamo. From Zamo? Alkane. And from Tandiswa, it's alkane. Sorry, just say that again. From Zamo, B H S and Zamo. Yeah. Uh, it's L K. Uh huh. And from Tandiswa, Chikwana, it's L K. All right, fine. So we're going to find out more about that one. Okay, thank you for your comments, Zamo and Tandiswa. All right, nice to have you online. Then look at compound C. There we have C four H H O. Compound D C three H H O. Now, look at compound E. Compound E has that hydroxyl group, the OH group. Let me ask you this question. Is that an ester or is it an alcohol? What would you say? Can we have a comment from the, from the students, the learners? Is it an ester or an alcohol? Do we have a comment there, Zandi? We have a hint from Tandi Swa. Tandi okay. Tandi Swa ahead and enter. So I say that one is an alcohol. Yeah, it's an alcohol. Well done, Tandi Swa. Nice hearing your voice. Very good. 
It's an alcohol. You're right. Keep it up. We're proud of you. And then if you look at that compound F, there we go. Is that an alcohol or is that an ester? What would you say? Right in the middle. Look at that functional group. Okay, we have a hand from Kevin. Kevin, go ahead. Uh, it's an, it's an Esther. Well done, Kevin. Keep it up. Well done, Kevin. Excellent. All right. Well done, Greg Charles. Nice to have you interacting, which is great. Okay. And then, of course, question 2.2. We need to write down the UPAC name of compound A, compound B. Then in question, in question C, uh, 2.3, we focus on compound C as a functional isomer of compound A. And we're going to write down the structural formula. And then in question 2.4, we're going to look at a process that involves the preparation of an ester. Right, so let's go into this. Fine. Now that we have that, question 2.1 says to us, write down the letter that represents each of the following. The hydrocarbon 2.1. All right, 2.1.1. The correct answer is... B. And that compound is an alkene because it's a double bond there. All right. An alkene. So it's a hydrocarbon because there's only carbon and hydrogen atoms involved in there. Regardless of the fact that there's a double bond, it is a hydrocarbon, that alkene. Now, as we heard correctly, there we have 2.1.2, the alcohol compound D and compound E. We remember Tadiswa told us that compound E is an alcohol. All right, so keep that in mind. Compound D is an alcohol or compound E as well. And then the ester we heard from Kevin just now, he correctly identified that as F. Well done. Very good, grade 12. Now, we need to write down the UPAC name of compound A. Look at compound A now. How many carbons are there? One, two, three, four. There's four carbons. So it's got to do with but, B-U-T. Remember that? Because there's four carbons. And then we have hydrogens with an oxygen attached. So what is that compound called? Here's the answer. It is butanel. Right? Butanel. Great 12. So let me ask you this question. The compound butanel, is that... An aldehyde or a ketone? Which one would you say it is? Any comment from the audience? Not yet, Mr. Goldstone. Okay. Is it um, an aldehyde or from... ketone? Sorry, who is that? From Rosemary. Rosemary? Uh, aldehyde. Well done. Well done, Rosemary. It's an aldehyde, you're right. And what gives it away is at the end, it's an AL. There it is. Now, it's butanel because there's four carbons. That's why it's butanel. And so, the compound B, let us now write down the UPEC name of compound B. I'd like you to focus on the double bond. The double bond shows that it is an in, it's an alkene. And that particular double bond is the first double bond. Remember, they must get the lowest number in the compound. Hence, it will be dash one dash in. Now, look at how many carbons are there in the straight chain. One, two, three, four. Ah, so it's going to be but dash one dash in. Remember that? But look at the substituent or the attachments, one can say. Well, I see on the second carbon a methyl group. On the third column, there are two methyl groups, right? So, what is the name of that compound? Remember, I had but dash one dash in. On the second column, I have a methyl group. On the third column, I have a methyl group on top and a methyl group at the bottom. One can say, well, here it is. The compound is called two. Comma three, comma three dash trimethyl but 
dash dash that's how you get your full three marks for that particular number. Well done, great jobs. I'm sure you appreciate the fact that that's the way to go. All right, now let's move on. Question two. Here's another one. <clears throat> letters A to F in the table. We're still busy with this table. Now we're going to focus on compound C. They tell us that compound C is a functional isomer of compound A. Now remember, functional isomers, we reviewed that earlier on. Write down the structural formula of compound C. Right? How do you think you'll be able to do the structural formula of compound C? Well, when we write that out, there we see it. There are four carbons. Notice compound C. So we have one, two, three, four. Then there's eight hydrogens. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And there's an oxygen double bonded. Remember, every carbon must have four bonds. So two for the oxygen, two for the carbons on either side. And notice what we've done, everybody. You must ring the functional group. By the way, that is a ketone. Keep in mind, that's a ketone. You know why it's a ketone? Because as we saw earlier on, the carbon is double bonded to oxygen that is just before it. Well, now we come to the next question. <clears throat> the next question says, compound D is used as one of the reactants to prepare compound F. Uh, compound D is used as one of the reactants to prepare compound F. Now, we heard from Kevin earlier on, he was correctly so, that compound F is an ester. So what reaction is used to prepare the esters? That's a question to you, Greg Ross. What is the name of the reaction which esters are prepared? What do we call that reaction? I'm sorry, Mr. Wolfstone. Yeah. There's a problem with your sound, sir. Oh, dear. Maybe your um, internet is unstable, sir. Okay. Can you hear me clearly now? Okay, can you proceed? I will um, okay. let you know if it's still unclear. Okay. All right. Uh, does the let's hear the question 2.4.1? Type of reaction which takes place to prepare compound F. Is the sound clear now, Zandi? Yes, sir. You can continue. Okay, fine. Any comment from the Pertwals? What reaction is used to prepare an ester? What's the name of that reaction? Yes. Yeah. What is that? Sorry, I. Esterification. Eh? Well done. Esterification. Another name for esterification is also condensation. All right. As you know. Well done. Thank you for that comment. All right. So the correct answer is esterification. And the name of compound D, very easy. That is propane dash one dash O. We know it's propane because there's three carbons there. All right. The structural formula of the other organic compound used, remember propanol, right, which is an alcohol, plus a carboxylic acid must give rise to an ester, right? So we have to write down the structural formula for carboxylic acid. There we see it clearly. That's going to be butanoic acid. And we ring at the end, as you can see, the carboxyl group. They are four carbons, carbon, 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 right? So that's the carboxyl group. What is the UPEC name for compound F? Let me ask you this question. We have propanol plus butanoic acid. What would you say is the name of the ester that is formed? You did this in term one during your practical investigation. Any comments from the audience? You're doing very well with your participation today. What's the name of this F, this ester? Yes. 
That's the question. What is the name? Yes. What would you say? Propile. Yeah. Two, three, four. It's four carbons. Look, channel it. Thank you. Now say the full thing. Yeah, right, was, silica acid has got one, two, three, four carbons. Right. right. So, what is your final answer? What is your what is your final answer? <laughs> Don't be shy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Can we mute that sound, please? Thank you. <laughs> yes, that's it. Propyl butanoate. That's correct. Well done. Very good. And we did the uh, great of learner actually breaking it up. Well done. Now remember, as you analyze it, you had propyl, you had butanoate, you were correct, you were spot on correct, but you must put it together to get your full marks. Okay? Keep that in mind. Well done. Very good indeed. All right, let's move on to another one. Here's another question. Look at this question. Consider the organic compounds represented by the letters A to C below. Now, I know you've got your worksheets in front of us. I'm going to go slightly quicker now because you've had to look at this. There we have compound A, compound B, and compound C. Now, write down the name of the homologous series to which compound C belongs. What would you say that is? Any comment from the audience? Compound C, look at that. Look at its functional group. Which homologous series does it belong to? Do we have a comment, Zandi? Uh, not yet, Mr. Goldstone. Okay, how's my sound now? Perfect, sir. Oh, thank you. Well done. All right, so the homologous series is none other than a keto. It's a keto. So the UPEC name not... of... Sorry? We have a comment from Tandi Swa. Yeah. He said it, it's a keto. Yeah, very correct as you can see on the screen. Well done. Very nice, Tandi Swa. Very nice. Now, 2.12, the UPEC name of compound A. Look at compound A. Just look at compound A. There's hydrogens, carbons. It's, a, it's an alkane of a sort. However, it's a special type of alkane. Because then we see chlorine and chlorine. Can you see that? So it's a halo alkane of some sort. Now, let's see. What is its compound? What is its name? Here we go. Note the first chlorine is on the third carbon. Right on top. So one, two, three, there's a chlorine there. Then as you come down, you get on carbon number five, another chlorine. So that's why we have three comma five dash dichloro. On the fourth carbon, we have the methyl. Now remember, the halogens must always be named before the oxygen. That's why the compound, and they are eight carbons in the longest chain. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's why it's octane. So the complete name, what will get you your full three marks, is three comma five dash dichloro dash four dash methyl octane. That is the correct answer. And you'll get marks for everything that's right along that line. Okay. Well done, Great. Well, good. 
then we need to draw this, write down the structural formula of a tertiary alcohol. That is the structural enzyme of compound B. There we have the structural formula of that. Okay, there we have it. That's tertiary alcohol. That is the structural enzyme of compound B. Moving on. An alcohol and methanoic acid are heated in the presence of concentrated sulfuric acid to form an ester. What is the role of the concentrated sulfuric acid in this reaction? Would anybody like to men mention that? Remember that was term one practical? What's the role of concentrated sulfuric acid in this reaction? What would you say, grade 12? Any comment? Sandile? Not yet, Mr. Goldstone. All right. You may remember, grade 12, that this concentrated sulfuric, sulfuric acid was, it acted as a catalyst. And it's good as a catalyst because it has dehydrating properties as well. And so that's what you'll see in the solution that's given. All right. So it's a dehydrating agent. Write down the next question, the name or the formula of the inorganic product form. <clears throat> now, the inorganic means something that does not have carbon in because that's organic. And of course, the inorganic compound is water. Remember, an alcohol plus a carboxylic acid will always give rise to an ester plus water. Very important. Now, the next part of the question goes into grade 10 and 11 chemistry. We start dealing with empirical formula and molecular formula. So let's revise this because, you know, those years are a long time gone and passed. And yeah, we are in grade 12. We're mainly concerning ourselves with this. However, it's important that we focus on this. We are told that the ester contains 6,67% hydrogen. 40% carbon, and 53,33% oxygen. If you add up those percentages, you'll get 100%, which means it's a balanced compound. The molecular mass of the ester is 60 grams per mole. Use a calculation to determine its empirical formula. Now, grade 12s, remember, when you're dealing with empirical formula, Put your compounds in a line. In other words, we're trying to find a ratio. Put your carbon first. Sorry? We have a hand up from Florida High School. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Florida, you can go ahead and ask your question. Florida. Okay. All right, fine. Thank you, Zandi. Appreciate it. I'll move on until that hand uh, surfaces again. Okay. So we need to put our compounds in order. Start with your carbon, followed by your hydrogen, followed by your oxygen. Right. So under that, we need to take those percentages and divide them by the molar mass of each of the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen respectively found on the periodic table. So what is the molar mass of carbon? The periodic table will tell us it is 12. What is the molar mass of hydrogen? The periodic table will tell us it is 1. And what is the atomic mass or the molar mass of oxygen? Periodic table will tell us it's 16. So once we have that, now we have things in order. Notice we have the, mol the moles of carbon is to the moles of hydrogen is to the moles of oxygen. We take the 40 for the carbon divided by the 12. Where did we get the 12 from? The periodic table of elements shows that carbon's atomic number is 6 its atomic mass is 12, and so on. And we use that principle as we go out. 
So what do we get for 40 divided by 12? The calculator will tell us 3,33. 6,67 divided by 1, we know is 6,67. And then 53,33 divided by 16 is going to give us 3,33. If we divide them to find the simplest ratio, which is what empirical formula is all about, we get a ratio of 1 is to 2 is to 1. In other words, we take those decimals and we divide them by the lowest number. The lowest number is 3,33. We're going to get 1 is to 2 is to 1. Hence, the empirical formula of the compound is C1H2O1. And there we have it. What about the next question, the molecular formula now? Well, that's easy. If we take that CH2O and add the constituent atomic masses, we get 30 grams per mole for its molar mass. Now we must take what we were given, the molar mass of the ester was 60 grams per mole, divided by the 30 grams per mole, we're going to get 2. And now we multiply each of the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen by 2. Hence, from the empirical formula, we get C2H4O2. That's how we get the molecular formula for that. Very nice question. Very easy. In fact, a great 10, 11 question. Very right there in the matric paper. If we have to write down the structural formula of methanoic acid, there we go. Well, that's easy. There we have one carbon, right? Notice, and there hydrogen, and there we have the carboxylic group on that side. There. All right? And the UPAC name of the ester that is formed, well, that is none other than methyl methanoate. Very important. Okay, if we do that, well, we have our 19 marks. So remember, grade 12's nomenclature is a very important part of the organic chemistry situation. Very, very important. Let's look at another question. Here we have the letters A to F in the table below represent six organic compounds. Right? We have the methanoic acid, pentanol, C, D, E, F. Write down the letters that represent the following. A ketone. Well, a ketone is compound F. 2.1.2, two compounds that are functional isomers in that table. There we have B, and there we have F as well. A hydrocarbon, let's look for hydrocarbon. Can you see a hydrocarbon? Look at option C. It's only got carbon and hydrogen. Yes, it's option C. And then we move on for compound D, write down the homologous series to which it belongs. Well, all I see there are carbons, hydrogens, and I see two bromines. To me, that's a halo alkane. Did you get that? Yes. It's a halo alkane. Very important. And then the U name of compound D, what is that going to be? Well, if you look very carefully, it's 3, 5 dash dibromooctane. If you look at this, eight carbons in the longest chain, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? There's eight carbons. And therefore, there are two bromines attached to carbon number three and carbon number five. Hence, it becomes 3,5 dash dibromooctane. That is the correct impact name of compound D. Very good. Now, when we move on, we're looking at compound F. Look at compound F. And I can hear you saying it. I can hear you say compound F is a ketone. And you know what? Right. The functional group gave it away. Now, write down the UPAC name of its positional isomer. Remember, positional isomer. So the position of the bond is just moved. The functional group is just moved along the chain. Well, it's pentan dash three dash own. Right. Still a ketone. Right, but the position is just more. What about the chain isomer? Well, 
Well, there we go. Now we rearrange things. So that becomes three dash methyl butan dash two dash O. It's still a ketone, but all we've done is we've rearranged it. So do you notice, grade twelves, that in connection with positional isomers and chain isomers, the compound does not change its homologous series. It's only for functional isomers where the ketones become aldehydes, where the carboxylic acids become esters and interchangeably so. So keep that in mind, very important. Now, 2.4, during the reaction of compound A with compound E in the presence of an acid catalyst, two products are formed. For the organic product form, write down the UPAC name of the compound. We're looking at compound A, methanoic acid, and compound E. There we have that. There we have our hexanol. That's what it is. Hexanol. That's the alcohol. So the ester will be called hexyl methanoate. That's the ester. And then the next question, write down the structural formula of its functional group. And there we see its functional group given there. You may remember we reviewed all of that at the beginning of our program. Then question 2.5 moves on. It says compound C, which is given by the formula C10H22, reacts at high temperatures and pressures to form a three carbon alkene and an alkane as shown below, All right? By the way, compound C is called decane, just for your information. Notice the result is a three carbon alkene. So we have to take three carbons away from the 10 carbons, and then we are left with C7. Keep that in mind, seven, all right? We're going to come back to that in a moment. The questions say, write down the type of reaction that takes place. Now, when a long chain alkane is broken up into smaller compounds, what is that reaction called? Any comment from our audience? Do you remember that? Long chain alkanes? broken up into smaller pieces, one can say. What is that called? Do we have a comment there, Zandi? Any comments there, Zandile? Right? That's called cracking or elimination. All right? And the molecular formula for compound Q is C7H16. The structural formula for compound P is given as that. There we have our three carbons, and we have a double bond between the two, the first two carbons, and there we go. All right? Um. Sorry, Mr. Goldstone, we have a comment from Craig. Craig, yeah. Um, cracking. Well done, Craig. It's cracking. Well done. Outstanding, Craig. Well done. I'm so proud of you. Keep it up, Craig. Well done. It's cracking. You're right. Yes. And remember, cracking is an elimination reaction. Also, grade 12s, remember that there are two forms of cracking that we deal with. You can have thermal cracking which involves heat, and the other one is catalytic cracking that involves the use of a catalyst as well. So you may just want to read up about that. The answer series textbook discusses that in detail, so you may just want to read up about that. But cracking is fine. Well done, Craig. Excellent. Okay, so there we have it. Craig Twells, that was our first section dealing with nomenclature. Now we move on to the physical properties of organic compounds boiling point you must know these three definitions is defined as the temperature at which the vapor pressure of a substance equals the 
atmospheric pressure. You must use the term, the temperature at which. You get one mark for that. And then vapor pressure of a substance equals atmospheric pressure. Very important. What is melting point? Melting point is defined as the temperature at which the solid and the liquid phases of a substance are at equilibrium. And thirdly, vapor pressure is defined as the pressure exerted by a vapor at equilibrium with its liquid in a closed system. Those are three important definitions. Remember, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point. The stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the melting point. The stronger the intermolecular forces, the lower the vapor pressure. So boiling point and, and melting point go in one direction and vapor pressure acts in the, uh, in the other direction. If you have a strong, a high vapor pressure, you automatically are going to have a low boiling point and a low melting point. But if you have a high boiling point and a high melting point, you're going to have a low vapor pressure. We spoke about intermolecular forces. Now let's have a look at the intermolecular forces that are characterizing the various homologous series. Please remember, grade 12, that for the alkenes, the alkanes and the alkynes, the intermolecular forces that occur in those three families of compound are London forces. Some books call them dispersion forces. Fine, but stick with London forces. Remember, the alkanes, the alkenes, the alkynes have London forces. What about the aldehyde? The ketones and the haloalkanes, they have both London forces and dipole-dipole forces. The forces are getting stronger now. Dipole-dipole forces. The alcohols and carboxylic acids have three types of intermolecular forces. Number one, London forces. Number two, dipole-dipole forces and they have strong hydrogen bonds. So have you got that summary? The alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes have London forces. Aldehydes, ketones, haloalkanes have both London forces and dipole-dipole forces. And the alcohols and carboxylic acids have London forces, dipole-dipole forces, as well as hydrogen bonding. Very good. Now, Let's go into a question. Learners investigate factors which influence the boiling points of alcohols. They use equal volumes of the alcohols to heat them separately in water in a water bath. The temperature at which each boils is measured. The results obtained are shown in the table below. Notice the alcohols. Now you need to keep your mind active. Remember, we just reviewed the intermolecular forces. Right, that occur in them. We have butan dash one dash all, pentan dash one dash all, hexan dash one dash all. And notice the boiling point 117,7 degrees, 138, it's getting higher. Right, I'm going to let you work on this for a while. Look at the questions. Let me just go through the questions with you briefly. Define the term boiling point. We reviewed that. What properties of alcohols requires them to be heated? In a water bath. Then 3.3 .3 says the boiling points of alcohols are compared with each other. What structural requirements must the alco alcohols need to make in order for it to be a fair comparison or a fair test? Fully explain the trend in the boiling points. All right. I'll give you three minutes for that. How's that? Right. You work on that grade 12 and then we'll review. Zandi, do you want to mention to the audience that they need to fill in the register in the meantime? Yes, please, Mr. Goldstone. Yeah. Um, I will post it, a, post it again on the chat. If they can do that in the meantime, I would appreciate that. Oh, we will appreciate that, sir. All right, great. Thank you, Zandi.
All right, grade 12s, I'm sure you've got many of the points. Let's have a look at 3.1. Define the term boiling point. Would someone in our audience like to mention the definition of boiling point? Let's see whether you'll get two marks. Any volunteers? Not yet. Okay, there's a hand from Tandiswa. All right, Tandiswa, go ahead. So it is the temperature at which the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. Excellent. Well done. Two marks. Well done, Tadiswa. Question 3.2. What properties of alcohols require them to be heated in a water bath? Any comments from your side? Why must we heat them in a water bath? Not on an open flame. Um, there's a comment from Rosemary. Rosemary, go ahead. Flammable. They are flammable. Yeah, of course, they're flammable. Yes, they'll catch fire very, very quickly. And so that's something that really needs to be ensured that it doesn't happen. Okay, they're flammable. Very good. Now, the boiling points of the alcohols are compared with each other. 3.3.1, what structural requirements must the alcohols meet to make it a fair comparison? Here's the answer. We should use straight chain primary alcohols, right? If we use some primary, some secondary alcohols, and some tertiary alcohols, that would be a very unfair comparison. So they must all be the same. So the correct answer is use straight chain primary alcohols. How do we explain the trend in the boiling points? Well, let's look at structure before we look at intermolecular forces. The structure, the chain length, or more carbons in the chain, the molecular size, molecular mass, right, increases from top to bottom. All right. In other words, it increases from butanol to hexan dash one dash all, right? Butan dash one dash all to hexan dash one dash all. The chain length increases. So any one of those. And what about the intermolecular forces? Well, the intermolecular forces increase from butan dash one dash all to hexan dash one dash all. And of course, we know the intermolecular forces are London forces, okay? Very, very important. And great Charles, if I can mention, try and stick to London forces rather than van der Waals forces. Because you see van der Waals forces also include dipole-dipole forces. So you're not really clear if you're gonna use the term van der Waals forces. We recognize that dipole-dipole forces, special type of van der Waals forces. Yes, of course. However, if you say uh, London forces, you are specifically referring to, as you know, the alkanes, the alkenes, and the alkynes. If you say London forces and dipole-dipole forces, well, now you're referring to the aldehydes, the ketones, and so on. The alcohols, carboxylic acids, there you go. And so the story goes, right? Just as we saw in the table that was presented. Now, what about the energy? Well, the energy needed to overcome the intermolecular forces increases from butan dash one dash all to hexan dash one dash all. So in a question like this, you must look at three things, the structure, the intermolecular forces, and the energy. Remember, the stronger your intermolecular forces are, the more energy you will need to break down those bonds. 3.4, how will the boiling point of hexan dash one dash all be affected if the volume of hexan dash one dash all used is double? Choose from increases, decreases, remains the same. Well, the truth of the matter is it will frankly remain the same. There will be no change whatsoever. Right? It will stay the same. In another investigation, the learners compared the boiling points of hexan dash one dash all to hexanol. So now here's the comparison, an alcohol with an aldehyde. Now 
data set. The independent variable. What do you think the independent variable would be? It would no doubt be the functional group, right? That is involved. Or one could even say the type of homologous series. It relates to that as well. There we go. So that's the independent variable. Then they say they find that the boiling point of hexane dash one dash all is higher than that of hexanel. When you see that boiling point, you now must think in terms of intermolecular forces. What are the intermolecular forces found in the alcohol? What are the intermolecular forces found in the aldehyde? That's what that 3.5.2 question is exploring. So, what is the point? How do we explain this observation? Firstly, let's look at the type of intermolecular forces. We know between the molecules of an, of an aldehyde or hexanel, we have dipole-dipole forces, and one can also say London forces as well. And the forces be, between the molecules of an, alder, of an alcohol, we saw in our table, London forces, dipole-dipole forces, as well as hydrogen bonds that are strong. Very important. So you put down your intermolecular forces for each. What is the strength of the intermolecular forces? Well, we know that dipole-dipole forces are weaker than hydrogen bonds, right? Very important point. And what about the energy? More energy will be needed to overcome the stronger hydrogen bonds and so on, all right? So once again, we, there we have it. The type of intermolecular forces, the strength of the forces, as well as the energy that is expended in the process there. That was a very nice question, not so, based on physical properties. Now, here we have another question, question three, right? I'm going to give you a minute or two to work through this one as well. You need to define the term boiling point. We're not going to ask Tadiswa because he's already got that down. <laughs> well done, Tadiswa. What is the relationship between the strength of the intermolecular forces and boiling point? I mentioned that, you remember. Then we're given a table. We have propane, propane dash two dash own, propane dash one dash all, and propanoic acid. Compound A is an alkane, compound B is a ketone, compound three is an alcohol, compound D is a carboxylic acid. Very nice question. And then they say 3.3, .3, refer to the type and strength of intermolecular forces to explain the differences. I'm going to give you two minutes to work through this question. All right. All the best, grade 12s. Right, how are you doing there, grade 12s? I know you're winning. You've been doing so well. And we really want to thank you very much for your participation in our program this morning. Keep it up. That's the way to go to success, to participate, because then you are really becoming a champion. 
So let's review 3.1. Would someone like to define boiling point for us? Do we have a comment there, Zandile? Um, not yet, Mr. Goldstone. <laughs> You see, I banned Tadiswa because he knows. <laughs> All right. So as we know, we heard from Tadiswa earlier on. Well done, Tadiswa. Boiling point is defined as the temperature at which the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. Right. Notice, temperature gets you a mark there. Then 3.2. What is the relationship between the strength of the intermolecular forces and boiling point? Any comment from the audience? No comment, sir. All right. Remember, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point. So if you've got a high boiling point, you'll have strong intermolecular forces. That's the point there. Now we move on. The relationship between the strength of the intermolecular forces and boiling point is investigated using four compounds. Question 3.3.1. Refer to the type and strength of intermolecular forces that occur between compounds A and B. Well, here it is. Compound A is an alkane. This has London forces only. Compound B is a ketone. And ketones have, as you know, London forces as well as dipole dipole forces hence the intermolecular forces in compound a are weaker than those in compound b we reviewed that earlier on. what about c and d <clears throat> well i can hear you saying it yes you're right both c and d have london forces dipole dipole forces and hydrogen bonds because compound C is an alcohol and compound D is a carboxylic acid. So they both have hydrogen bond. But compound D has two more sites for hydrogen bonding. And as a result of that, compound D has stronger intermolecular forces than compound C. Very important. Lastly, is compound B a gas? or a liquid at room temperature? Well, it frankly is a liquid, right? Ketone at 56 degrees, it's a liquid, not a gas. Right, let's look at our last question in connection with physical properties. Learners use compounds A, B, and C to investigate what are the factors that influences the vapor pressure of organic compounds. I love vapor pressure, very nice. A, butanol. B, butan dash 2 dash own, and C, propanoic acid. We're dealing with an alcohol, a ketone, and a carboxylic acid. Define the term vapor pressure. You remember from our program this morning, I can hear you even reciting this. Great 12s, well done, well done. It is the pressure exerted by a vapor at equilibrium with its liquid in a closed system. What is the independent variable for this investigation? It's the functional group. Don't forget that. You can also say the type of intermolecular force or the homologous series. Stick with functional group. You can't go wrong with that. 3.3. Which compound, A or B, has higher vapor pressure? Remember, high vapor pressure means low boiling point, low melting point. Which one of those has the higher vapor pressure, A or B? None other than B, because we know that the intermolecular forces in the ketones are not as strong as those in the alcohols, because the alcohols have strong hydrogen bonding. So the weaker one is the ketone, hence it's higher vapor pressure. And vapor pressure, as we know, is 
it's like when you go to one of these departmental stores like Edgar's, Woolworths, Markham's, and you're trying out some of their deodorants or some of their aftershaves, right? Or perfumes for the ladies, right? You spray it on your hand and it evaporates quickly from your skin. When that happens, that quick evaporation, that's an example of high vapor pressure. That's what we're really talking about here. And then 3.4, explain your answer in 3.3. Well, very easy, right? Hydrogen bonding occurs in A. Dipole-dipole forces are found in compound B as well. And so the strength of the intermolecular forces in compound A, right, much stronger in, than compound B. And there we go. All right. So the substance of that brings us to our solution. Then we have the graph below represents the relationship between vapor pressure, notice that's the dependent variable, and temperature, that's independent variable here, for compound A at sea level. X and Y represent different temperatures. Write down the term for the temperature represented by X. Now, the big clue is given to us by 101,3 kilopascals, and we know that that's called one bar, one bar of pressure. We know that the temperature, right, in degrees Celsius, 101,3, is none other than, as we will see, there we go, right? That temperature is the, 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 the state, of course, it's a gas, there's no doubt about that, but the temperature there, 101,3 kilopascals, 273 Kelvin, which is zero degrees Celsius, <clears throat> as we know. All right. And then when we move forward, 3.5.2, state the phase of compound A at temperature Y. Well, there we have it. It's a gas. All right. There we go. And if we have to draw sketches, redraw. On the same set of axes, the curve that will be obtained for compound C, label the curve A and C. So there we have curve A is there, and of course curve C will be below that. Right? It's getting closer and closer to the bottom. That's really what it is. All right, so grade 12, that has been the physical properties. Keep working on them. Remember boiling point, melting point, and vapor pressure. Now we move on to organic reactions, and this is the last question that we're going to do in our presentation here this morning. Although there are many other questions that follow this in the booklet that you have been given, right? We want you to work through those questions as well because they are also very, very important. But because of our time constraints, right, this question will serve us well for going through this. So, question here says, the flow diagram here represents the conversion of propane to propane-2-R. Notice, there we have that. Now, state one reaction condition for step one. I'm going to give you a few minutes for that. Write down the name or formula of the inorganic product formed in step one and name the type of substitution reaction in two, step two. Remember there's bromine there. Bromine is now being combined with propane. So I can hear you saying it. Yes, we're gonna get bromopropane. You're right, you are right, bromopropane. And it's gonna be a substitution reaction because one of the hydrogens from propane is going to come away and the bromine is going to attach itself there. Well done. I can hear you saying that too. All right. So 4.1.4, write down the name or the formula of the inorganic reagent needed in step two. In other words, where that bromopropane now becomes propane-2-O. The O is the big secret, the OH, right? I'm giving you the biggest clue. And then write down the UPEC name of compound X. And then we'll move on there. I'm going to give you two minutes for that. And then we're going to review this. All right. All the best.
All right, grade 12. I'm sure you have completed that. There we go. We're back 4.1.1. Just a little announcement, everybody. For those who haven't heard, could you kindly complete the register that is in the chat of this session? Okay, we need that. So if you could kindly do that, we'd really appreciate that. If you haven't done so already. All right. Sandy, can you hear me clearly? Yes, Mr. Goldstone. Okay, fine. I saw the feedback form. It's posted in the chat. Okay, good. Yes. Yes, thank you very much, Sandy. All right, so the feedback form as well as the register. If you can please complete that. Okay, <clears throat> now state one reaction condition for step number one. There must be heat or sunlight, ultraviolet light, whatever you want to say, that is an important reaction condition for step number one. All right? Very, very important. I'm sure you got that correct. Then 4.1.2, write down the name or formula of the inorganic product form. The inorganic product form is hydrogen bromide. Remember, one of the bromines, bromine is diatomic, attaches itself, it exchanges one of the hydrogens. So the hydrogen comes to the other bromine and the bromine goes to the molecule and there we have that inorganic product that is formed. 4.1.3, name the type of substitution reaction represented by step number two. That reaction is called hydrolysis. Very important. Hydrolysis. And then 4.1.4, write down the name of the formula or the inorganic reagent needed in step number two. The inorganic reagent needed is, you can say water, or you can say either sodium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide, or potassium hydroxide. Any one of those. Right? Very important. Any one of those would be on it. And then 4.1.5, write down the UPAC name of compound X. There we see compound X. It's going to be 2 dash bromopropane. Very important. Okay? 2 dash bromopropane. So the 2 represents where on the, on the chain the bromine is attached. Which carbon? It's a carbon number two. That's where it won't be at the end. It's always in the middle, right? There we go. Now we move on to the next part of the question, which is our final point that we're going to mention in our program this morning. Ethane can be prepared from chloroethane, and there we have the formula for that, by a two-step process. You are supplied with the following chemicals. We're given hydrogen gas, hydrochloric acid, chlorine gas, water, platinum, ethanol, concentrated sulfuric acid. Remember, that's battery acid as well, concentrated sulfuric acid, and concentrated sodium hydroxide. Right. That's a strong base, as you may know from chemistry. Select chemicals in the table above that can be used in the preparation of chloroethane. Use using condensed structural formula, write down a balanced equation for each reaction to indicate the reaction and indicate the reaction conditions for each reaction. Right now, that can be quite a bit of a mouthful to actually handle. Firstly, we need to take what we are given. Okay, and there we have chloroethane. We are given that. We must make chlorine, ethane, right? So obviously the chlorine must go. Right? So how do we get rid of the chlorine? We add concentrated sodium hydroxide in ethanol, right? That's the reaction condition, as you may know. And then that gives rise to our compound, CH2CH2 plus sodium chloride, plus 
water. What is that compound? CH2, CH2. That is none other than ethane. Combined, it is C2H4. Right? That's where we have that. Now, we need to take that further. When we look at, there we go, from what we have there, we combine that to hydrogen gas using platinum as our catalyst. Now we get our com compound of ethane. So in the first line of the formula, right, we have chloroethane, that's CH3, CH2Cl, plus concentrated sodium hydroxide in ethanol. That will give rise to CH, C2H4. You remember which compound is that? That's ethene plus sodium chloride, which is salt, plus water. We then take the ethene, that's an alkene, plus hydrogen, right? There we have an addition reaction that's taking place there now, using platinum as our catalyst. And now we get CH3, CH3. Combined, C2H6, which is what we know as ethane. Very important question. Eight marks, not for difficulty, but for the extent of the entire situation. That's a very, very nice question, that. Grade 12s, this is where we end our program today.